Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal offensive firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about the case of Ward in Quebec. You may have seen this case reported in the news as Supreme Court defends right to free expression or Supreme Court defends right to comedy, but I don't think the news has really been covering the full implications of this, so I want to go through it in some detail. Uh, this is a case about a comedian telling jokes, but it's going to have some larger implications, including on Trudeau's plans to potentially regulate online speech. So let's dive in and have a look at this, because I think understanding this in some detail is going to be really important. So I'm going to start off by letting the Supreme Court describe what this is about. So they say, the appeal is between Mr. Ward and the Commission, which is acting here for the benefit of Mr. Gabriel. In the proceedings below, the Commission also acted on behalf of Mr. Gabriel's parents, Sylvie Gabriel and Steve Lavoie. We take note that Mr. Gabriel and Ms. Gabriel are interveners in this appeal. Now, I'm just going to stop here and explain a little bit about what's going on. The way this commission works is that if you have a complaint, you bring it to the commission, and if the commission thinks you have a case, they can basically take over and represent you. Now, they do this at no cost to the person making the complaint. The flip side of that is that Mr. Ward is going to be bearing all of his own costs. So there's a real disparity here in terms of his ability to fight back versus their ability to keep pushing because they're essentially government funded. Now there's reasons for this. There's reasons why this might be a good idea. Uh, historically, people who have been the victims of discrimination in various uh, ways may have less financial means. And so we don't want to set up a system where people can't access these kinds of provisions simply because they've been discriminated against and are poor. So that is, but it is worth considering here when we think about the fact that this has gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. It was years in the making. Mr. Ward will have spent a lot of money defending this, and most people might not be in the same position to, to fight this. So that's just something worth considering at the outset, and it also can really affect incentives, because if it costs you nothing to bring a claim, you might bring claims that otherwise you would be hesitant to bring. Anyway, continuing on. At the time of the events alleged against Mr. Ward, Mr. Gabriel was a minor and a student in secondary school, and he had an artistic career as a singer. The circumstances in which Mr. Gabriel began that career at the age of eight and with his parents' support are commendable. He was born with Treacher Collins syndrome, which caused certain malformations of the head as well as profound deafness. When he was six years old, he received a bone anchored hearing aid that made it possible for him to hear 80 to 90% of sounds. Thanks to that hearing aid, he learned to speak and to sing. So a very impressive, that's an impressive personal story. Continuing on here. Uh, the first two years of his career, 2005 and 2006, were highlighted by several events that received media coverage. For example, performance of the national anthem at a sporting event, an invitation to sing for Celine Dion, and a musical performance in Rome in the presence of Pope Benedict. Yeah. He carried on with his career by taking part in a number of television shows, the production of a documentary about Treacher Collins Syndrome that was broadcast in France, the release of an album, and then his autobiography, and concerts. As a result of his fame, Mr. Gabriel became a patient ambassador for Shriners Hospitals in 2012. He traveled in Canada and the United States and volunteered to participate in shows and fundraisers. So again, that's an impressive career, and it looks like he's doing some good work with it. So nothing against Mr. Gabriel here. It looks like he's uh, working hard and trying to make the world a better place. Mr. Ward, for his part, is a professional comedian and a graduate of the École Nationale de l'Humour, so apparently they have a school for this, uh, whose career began in 1993. I didn't know there was a stand-up school, but there it is. His performances, for which he has won many awards, are, he says, in the style of dark comedy a comedy genre in which shocking subjects or social taboos are, translation, tackled. This would have been in French, the original tribunal, so that's why there's a lot of stuff that's going to be marked as translation. From September 2010 to March 2013, Mr. Ward gave a show called Mike Ward's Sexposé, so a little bit of a French pun there, the main theme of which was tolerance and the fact that we are all the same. Around 135,000 tickets were sold. This litigation centers on one of the routines in that show called The Untouchables. I think it was uh, titled uh, Les Vaches Sacrées, so the Sacred Cows. Uh, 
Uh, in that routine, Mr. Ward mocked certain figures in Quebec's artistic community who he described as sacred cows that could not be made fun of for various reasons, whether because of their wealth or their influence, or because they are seen as weak. And so Mr. Gabriel was one of the public figures referred to in the routine. Now, this is a part that gets deeply ironic because, of course, the entire routine is about you can't make fun of these people. And so he makes fun of them and turns around and now he's facing this, uh, this suit. Kind of ironic. In addition to that show, Mr. Ward made several videos on topical subjects that were posted on his website. The videos were about a number of public figures. One of them was posted in connection with the release of Mr. Gabriel's autobiography. In that video, Mr. Ward made disparaging comments about Mr. Gabriel's physical appearance. The evidence shows that students attending the same secondary school as Mr. Gabriel drew inspiration from some of the comments in that video to make fun of him. And of course, if you're, you know, high school sucks for lots of people. And if you're growing up with disabilities and especially visible disabilities like this, kids are going to be horrible. So the evidence also shows that at the time, Mr. Gabriel was already the subject of tasteless jokes by people who drew a connection between his performance for Pope uh, Benedict the 16th or his meeting with Cardinal Ouellette and pedophilia well before Mr. Ward made his comments about him. I suspect I'm going to get uh, some hassles from YouTube just for, uh, for using that word. All right. Too late now. In 2012, Mr. Gabriel's uh, parents filed a complaint with the commission on their own behalf and on behalf of Mr. Gabriel sometime after the broadcast of a television interview with Mr. Ward that included an excerpt from the routine called The Untouchables Concerning Their Son. The commission concluded that there was a basis for discrimination and referred the complaint to the tribunal. So now they're going to talk a little bit about the procedural history, and I'm not going to cover it in full detail, but I will look at it a little bit just so that we understand what's happened to get us to the Supreme Court. So the Human Rights Tribunal. The tribunal considered the three elements of discrimination within the meaning of the charter, namely one, a distinction, so drawing a distinction between different people, two, based on a prohibited ground, and three, that has the effect of nullifying or impairing the equal recognition or exercise of a human right or freedom. So distinction, you know, you're treating two people differently. It has to be based on a prohibited ground. So for instance, if I am running a bar, I might exclude somebody who has stolen from me in the past. You know, they came in, they ran up a huge tab and they left without paying. That guy tries to come in again and I say, nah, you're banned. That's a distinction. That person's banned and other people aren't but it's not based on a prohibited ground. Thievery is not a prohibited ground. Now, if I said, hey, listen, you're not allowed to drink here because you walk in with a cane, that would be a different story. So that's why that uh, is there. And three, that has the effect of nullifying or impairing the equal recognition or exercise of a human right or freedom. So first, Mr. Ward had subjected Mr. Gabriel to differential treatment by making comments about him in order to make his audience laugh. Second, Mr. Ward had made comments concerning Mr. Gabriel's disability, although he had not chosen Mr. Gabriel because of his disability. That's important. He made comments about his disability, hadn't chosen him because of it. The court's going to come back to that, so I'm just sort of shining a light on it so you remember this bit. Third, Mr. Ward's derogatory comments attained the degree of seriousness required by the case of Caligo International, the tribunal therefore concluded that by exposing Mr. Gabriel to mockery because of his disability, Mr. Ward had infringed Mr. Gabriel's right to the safeguard of his dignity in a discriminatory manner. Having found that all of the elements of discrimination had been established, the tribunal considered Mr. Ward's defense based on freedom of expression. In its view, Mr. Ward's comments exceeded the limits of what a reasonable person can tolerate in the name of freedom of expression. So, reasonable person can tolerate. That's kind of an interesting test there. The tribunal therefore held that the discrimination suffered by Mr. Gabriel was not justified. Mr. Ward was ordered to pay $25,000 in moral damages and $10,000 in punitive damages. That's a lot of money. I mean, it might not be a lot of money for Mr. Ward if he's selling out theaters and so forth, but to me, that'd be a huge amount of money. I, I suspect to most of my viewers, an award of $35,000, that might break you. That, you know, that's a, a huge amount of money. So if you think about, you know, how confident you're going to be about saying certain things, $35,000 is a whole lot of reason maybe not to. 
So the Quebec Court of Appeal, I'm going to skip over mostly. Uh, and they, uh, th this is one bit I will note at. They say, first, they pointed out that Mr. Ward had chosen Mr. Gabriel both because of his fame and because of his disability, and that the impugned comments had been directed specifically at the physical characteristics associated with that disability. So that is different than what the tribunal found. That's a change in the facts. And that's something the court is going to take note of because normally in order to flip facts from the original decision, you have to have some really good reason to say why the, the lower court uh, got it clearly wrong. And, and I'm not sort of articulating the test properly, but it has to be really a high level. Uh, we normally sort of take the take the position that the court that actually heard the evidence is in the best position to decide the facts. But I am going to look at the dissenting reasons a little bit because uh, the dissent sort of goes to the tribunal and raises some of the issues that we'll see coming up later on. So in dissent, uh, Justice Manon Savard, as the, she then was, began by pointing out the only legal issue raised in the case. So then again, this is a translation. The issue raised by the appeal is of an entirely different nature. It concerns the analytical framework to be adopted by the Human Rights Tribunal when it has to decide a complaint of discrimination resulting from expression and nothing else based on a ground prohibited under Section 10 of the Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. The issue also requires a review within that framework of the appropriate balance between the right to dignity and freedom of expression. Beyond the impugned expression, which was in the style, by definition shocking and trenchant, of the type of humor used by the appellant, did he discriminate against the impleted parties? And I stress that I'm saying discriminate and not defame because the tribunal has no jurisdiction in the latter case. So this is the distinction that the court is going to look at a few times. The distinction between discriminating in the sense of, you know, a larger issue with respect to those disability issues versus if he's sort of just defaming this particular person. And that's because the tribunal isn't allowed to deal with defamation claims. Those have to proceed through the ordinary processes of court, where, of course, Mr. Gabriel would have to proceed on his own dime. So there's reasons why Mr. Gabriel does not want to be proceeding in that fashion. So in the view of Savard, uh, who would have allowed Mr. Ward's appeal, the tribunal had erred, so they made a mistake, by excluding any comparative and contextual analysis in finding differential treatment. The fact that a person is targeted by name in a comedy show is not enough to establish a distinction within the meaning of Section 10 of the Quebec Charter. Uh, Savard also found that references to a prohibited ground that characterizes a person cannot, on their own, satisfy the first two elements of discrimination. So, it's not enough to simply reference a prohibited ground, there has to be more evidence than that. So in her opinion, the tribunal had also erred by considering interference with the right to the safeguard of dignity in isolation. It should have considered freedom of expression not as a defense that could justify discriminatory conduct, but as a limit to the scope of that right pursuant to section 9.1 of the Quebec Charter. This is an important point and one that is um, somewhat sort of difficult to explain, but I'm going to give it my best shot here. Uh, let me know in the comments below if I have made this clear or not. So basically the way the tribunal handed it, handled it is to say, listen, um, he's got a right to have his dignity protected. And then your argument is basically freedom ex of expression used as a sh sort of shield. You say, listen, yes, I infringed his, you know, right to dignity, but you know, that's justified because it's my freedom of speech. And what the uh, the dissenting justice here said at the Court of Appeal was, no, it's actually that the freedom of expression limits the original articulation of how much you have a right to the safeguard of your dignity. So that is basically not a defense. It's actually saying you don't actually have a right to have your dignity protected in a way that impedes my freedom of expression. And I'm sort of generalizing here a little bit i'm not being perfectly exact but i hope that sort of explains the distinction here so that provision she found requires a balancing of freedom of expression and the right to the safeguard of dignity relying on the principles set out in watcott which is a big uh, hate speech case uh, savard concluded that mr ward's comments did not 
constitute discriminatory speech, and that the tribunal had therefore erred in finding otherwise. So there's a split decision at the Court of Appeal. And I'm going to skip over here. I'll cover the legislation a little bit here. So three talks about every person is the possessor of the fundamental freedoms, including conscience, religion, opinion, expression, peaceful assembly, and freedom of association. And then four is every person has a right to the safeguard of his dignity, honor, and reputation, which seems pretty broad. In exercising the, and this is 9.1, which is a critical section here, it's going to be referenced a lot. It says, in exercising his fundamental freedoms and rights, a person shall maintain a proper regard for democratic values, public order, and the general well-being of the citizens of Quebec. So the way the court is, you know, or at least the way the dissenting justice noted it is basically to say that this operates as a limit on that section four right. It could equally, by my sort of reading on this, also say that Mr. Ward's freedom of expression might be limited by that safeguard of dignity, honor, and reputation. That's kind of a matter of interpretation. We'll have to look at how the court deals with that. And there's also section 10 here, which is a discrimin or and it's, sorry, it continues. In this respect, the scope of the freedoms and rights and uh, limits to their exercise may be fixed by law. And then there's section 10. Every person has a right to full and equal recognition and exercise of his human rights and freedoms without distinction, exclusion, or preference based on race, color, sex, pregnancy, sexual orientation, civil status, age except as provided by law, because of course there may be things like mandatory retirement ages, uh, drinking ages, voting ages, that kind of thing, uh, religion, political convictions, language, ethnic or national origin, social condition, a handicap, or the use of any means to palliate a handicap. So anything that you might do to remediate a handicap, so you can't say, for instance, wheelchair users are welcome, but cane users are not, unless there's some reason why, you know, that might make sense. Uh, discrimination exists where such a distinction, exclusion, or preference has the effect of nullifying or impairing such right. So this is very broad here. Political convictions are included. That's not normally included in a lot of rights documents, but here it is. I'm going to skip over the standard of review stuff because that... While it's interesting to me, probably not so much to you guys. So they're also going to note here, they say, in this regard, it is important to be clear that the comments made by Mr. Ward about Mr. Gabriel did not lead to an action in defamation, but rather to a discrimination claim. This distinction is important because the tribunal has no power to decide actions in defamation or other civil liability actions, since its jurisdiction is limited to complaints of discrimination or exploitation based on sections 10 to 19 and 48 of the Quebec Charter. So once again, the court is basically saying, hmm, maybe this should have been a defamation action. Maybe you're bringing it in the wrong forum. This is something that we'll see they bring up a few times. Tribunal can hear disputes involving expression like the comments made in this case, only if the expression may constitute discrimination may, uh, within the meaning of section 10 of the charter. The Quebec Charter gives the tribunal direct albeit limited jurisdiction over certain types of expression, insofar as it prohibits discriminatory harassment and advertising. However, this limited direct jurisdiction has been extended indirectly in recent decades as a result of a line of decisions generously interpreting both of the two main provisions at issue. That is, the provision setting out the right to equal recognition and exercise of rights and freedoms, and that setting out the right of every person to the safeguard of their dignity, honor, and reputation. According to that line of decisions, Hurtful expressions relating to a ground listed in Section 10 of the Quebec Charter constitutes discrimination and may be within the tribunal's jurisdiction, even if the harm suffered is relative and the social effects of discrimination, such as the perpetuation of prejudice or disadvantage, are absent. So, basically what the court here is saying, they're expressing a concern that these human rights tribunals have been taking on more and broader uh, authority to themselves in order to regulate more speech than is properly within their ambit. So this is essentially the court giving us a little comment to say that they are reining in human rights tribunals to say, listen, you guys are going too far. You got to have to back it up. And that is a bit of a big deal because there are cases and issues springing up across Canada with respect to, uh, this question of how much should human rights tribunals really 
uh, regulate people and regulate their speech. In addition to being based solely on the content of expression and not on its discriminatory effects, that line of decisions, which includes the tribunal's judgment, dispenses with any fair balancing of freedom of expression and protection of the right to the safeguard of dignity. It therefore creates a second avenue of recourse for discrimination parallel to an action in defamation to compel a person to answer for the harm caused by their words with a much less onerous burden of proof on the complainant, who in fact is not required to bring their own proceedings if the commission act, agrees to act on their behalf. So essentially they're saying if you're upset here, then instead of proceeding by defamation, which would have been the previous method, because of this expansion of the authority of human rights tribunals, you can use those and there you the burden of proof is less. You don't have to establish some of the things that otherwise would have been you know, needed to establish a defamation claim. And also you don't have to pay your own bills. The commission will do it. So the court is expressing some concern here about human rights tribunals in general and about those potential issues and essentially saying we are writing out freedom of expression in this way. And so the court is going to come back and say, no, freedom of expression has to have some real muscle to it. In our view, that line of decisions raises serious concerns in light of our precedents on freedom of expression. A discrimination claim is not and must not become an action in defamation. The two are governed by different considerations and have different purposes. A discrimination claim must be limited to expression whose effects are truly discriminatory. Our analysis below reflects this perspective and in clarifying the legal framework that applies to a discrimination claim based on sections 4 and 10 of the Quebec Charter in a context where forms of verbal expression are an issue, drawing from the principles established in Watcott with the necessary modifications. So again, the court is saying, listen, this can't be a backdoor defamation claim. It's got to be seriously discriminatory. And previously the court had very much limited what kinds of speech, what kinds of expression could be limited by government action. So essentially they're saying, you, you know how we said that, that, that this is the line back in this other decision, Watcott? Well, it's still the line we're going to back you up to where that line is. You know, you've stepped way over it. We're going to push you back. So that's uh, going to be welcomed for some people and probably less so for others. But that is ex essentially what the court is doing here is they're saying, we already told you where the line was on freedom of expression. We want you back there. Uh, back you go. Just for time reasons, I've jumped ahead through a whole bunch of things. I recommend reading this case. It's a really important case. I will link it in the description below. Check it out. So right to the safeguard of dignity. This court has recognized that human dignity is among the values that underlie the Canadian Charter. However, the Quebec Charter goes further because human dignity is not only a fundamental value in that statute, but also a right the safeguard of which is specifically protected. Section 4 of the Quebec Charter sets out the right of every person to the safeguard of his dignity. But as several authors agree, Behind this eloquent turn of phrase is a right whose scope is particularly difficult to identify. So what does it mean to have your dignity harmed? What does it mean to have your dignity protected? You know, does that mean that nobody can ever make fun of you? Or is it more narrow than that? Court's going to address that. Courts have found interference with the right to the safeguard of dignity in a wide variety of contexts. For example, they have found an infringement of Section 4 of the Quebec Charter in the following cases. Patients with an intellectual disability were deprived of hygiene care by hospital center staff taking part in an illegal strike. An illustrator's copyright was seriously infringed. An individual suspected of theft was beaten, tortured, and threatened with death by police officers. A senior civil servant was denied access to an official residence following his publicized firing based on sexual harassment allegations before a real investigation had been completed. YouTube censors, cut me some slack here. This is a legal case. A visually impaired man was denied access to a discotheque dance floor with his guide dog. Workers of Chinese origin were forced to listen to their employer's racist admonishments. A senior executive was the target of sexist and offensive remarks by the host of a shock jock radio show. A couple was arrested and charged with criminal offenses on the basis of falsified police reports. 
And there's uh, also intimate photographs were sent to third parties without authorization. So a wide range of things. The court says, in addition to these very diverse cases, there's a long line of decisions in which disrespect is readily regarded as an infringement of Section 4 as long as it is of some seriousness. So disrespect has been found to be enough in some of those previous cases. And the court is noting this with some concern. So translation here, in reality, uh, and this is quoting from a previous decision uh, or from the, uh, yes, from a previous decision here. In reality, interference with dignity is raised on its own only very exceptionally. Claims for compensation for interference with dignity are almost always made as part of an action based on interference with another fundamental right, whether it be the right to reputation, the right to respect for one's private life, the right to equality, the right to physical inviolability, uh, etc. Courts will find interference with dignity where the interference with another fundamental right is particularly serious. In this sense, interference with dignity appears to be a threshold of seriousness for the infringement of another right. Defamatory statements must therefore reach a certain level of seriousness in order to constitute interference with personal dignity, in addition to interference with reputation. As a result, the concept of dignity is generally invoked as a modality of the other fundamental rights rather than as an independent right. This may seem surprising, but in reality it is simply a reflection of the fact that the legal concept of dignity is difficult to define with precision. So they're saying, instead of being its own right, it's a way of violating another right. That's what the previous case law seems to have been saying. So the court, uh, again, and now we're back to Ward, says, This commentary clearly illustrates the confusion surrounding the right to the safeguard of dignity. In our view, treating this right as a mere modality of the other fundamental rights trivializes the very terms of Section 4. The scope of one fundamental right cannot be determined on the basis of the degree to which some other fundamental right is infringed. The right to the safeguard of dignity should not be invoked to protect an interest that is already fully secured by another fundamental right because that other fundamental right is itself grounded in dignity. This lack of coherence in the application of Section 4 causes at least two significant problems in relation to the issue before us here. First, the uncertain scope of this provision makes any balancing of rights under Section 9.1 difficult. Section, or second, the combination of Section 4 and 10 tends to change the nature of the norm of equality provided for in the Quebec Charter and to extend the jurisdiction of the Commission and the Tribunal well beyond what the legislature intended. Indeed, some authors have noted that the juxtaposition of the two provisions greatly broadens the scope of the norm of equality. Now, why would the tribunal and the commission want a broad jurisdiction? Well, everybody wants more power. That's, you know, that's always an issue. And that's why we have higher courts is to say, no, you have exceeded your power. You got to be, you know, we got to rein that in. In our view, this results not from the structure of the Quebec Charter, but from a misinterpretation of the right to the safeguard of dignity, the imprecise nature of which is regarded as having the effect of lessening the plaintiff's burden of proof in a discrimination action. That reasoning makes an infringement of the right to equal recognition of the right to the safeguard of dignity easier to establish given the fact that dignity is always more or less affected when equality is denied, as the norm of equality flows from dignity. So basically what they're saying here is... Uh, it's been described in a fuzzy way, and that makes it real easy to get it somewhere into the range of dignity, where if we pin it down a little firmer and we have a, a more concise or more proper definition, that that's going to narrow the scope of when somebody can make a claim on that basis. So they say, in our opinion, such an approach amounts to circumventing the legislature's intention and making Section 10 of the Quebec Charter a vehicle for the protection of equality per se, comparable to that of the Canadian Charter. The difference, however, is that the Quebec Charter is much broader in scope than the Canadian Charter and other human rights statute. It does not apply only to dealings with the state or to certain areas of activity, but extends to all relationships between individuals. So the point they're making here is that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms has very broad protections. And the reason why it has those broad protections is because it applies only against the government. You know, I cannot, as a private citizen, violate your charter rights because you don't have any charter rights protecting you against what I do. 
unless I'm part of government. If I were a government actor, uh, for instance, say a police officer or you know a member of parliament, uh, in some fashion, then I might you know then I become bound by the charter. But simply as individuals, you you don't have charter rights against other sort of random people. But the Quebec Charter goes a step further. It does intend to restrict things between individuals. And so as a result of that, it's got to be somewhat narrower in order to avoid trampling the rights that are protected by the Canadian Charter, for example. All right, so they say, as we wrote in Bombardier, the Quebec Charter, unlike the Canadian Charter, does not protect the right to equality per se. This right is protected only in the exercise of the other rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Quebec Charter. An interpretation of Section 4 that overlooks this significant limitation must be rejected. The right to the safeguard of dignity is not, and must not become, incantory boilerplate. So, essentially, uh, what they mean by it can't be incantory boilerplate is it can't be something that you're always going to cite whenever you're bringing something to the tribunal. And that's their concern here, is that every claim is going to say, my dignity was impacted. So that's what I think that what they're trying to get at here. In our view, the interpretation of this provision must be refocused on its purpose by considering its wording and context. In St. Ferdinand, this court found that this right to the safeguard of dignity relates specifically to human dignity and protects against interferences with the fundamental attributes of a human being which violate the respect to which every person is entitled simply because he or she is a human being and the respect that a person owes to himself or herself. In other words, Section 4 does not protect every person as such, but protects the humanity of every person in its most fundamental attributes. It is therefore the concept of humanity that is at the center of the right to the safeguard of dignity. I think that's a, a powerful, although somewhat dense, uh, bit of language. It's basically taking a, away from the concept of dignity as like personal embarrassment or that kind of thing and talking about it as the essential qualities of hum humanness. Uh, does this degrade that person as not being human as opposed to does it just make them feel bad? So continuing on here, they say, in fact, the emergence in law of the concept of dignity and the meaning of this concept were shaped by the very specific historical context of the atrocities committed in the 20th century, particularly during the Second World War. And so I'm not going to name the specific events because I've already got enough things that uh, YouTube is not going to like hearing. But you know what they're talking about here, the real serious... Uh, invasions of human dignity that were part of that. So to be contrary to section four of the Quebec Charter, conduct must reach a very or must reach a high level of gravity that does not trivialize this very meaningful concept. Such conduct cannot be assessed in a purely subjective manner. An objective analysis is required because dignity is aimed at protecting not a particular person or even a class of persons, but humanity in general. So by elevating the standard for dignity here, they're narrowing the scope of potential claims on that basis. What Section 4 confers is not a right to dignity, but more precisely, a right to the safeguard of dignity. The connotation and meaning of the words chosen by the legislature in this section are much stronger than those of respect for the dignity in the preamble to the Quebec Charter. The term safeguard refers to a form of defense or protection against a peril whereas the term respect reflects the con uh, concept of regard or deference. And they quote here a little bit about French dictionaries, because of course it's a French statute. Unlike, for example, Section 5, which confers a right to respect for one's private life, Section 4 does not permit a person to claim respect for their dignity, but only the safeguarding of their dignity. That is, protection from the denial of their worth as a human being. Where a person is stripped of their of their humanity by being subjected to treatment that debases, subjugates, objectifies, humiliates, or degrades them, there is no question that their dignity is violated. In this sense, the right to the safeguard of dignity is a shield against this type of interference that does no less than outrage the conscience of society. So outrage the conscience of society. That's, they're setting the level pretty high here. 
So freedom of expression, they say, like the right to safeguard of dignity, freedom of expression flows from the concept of human dignity. And they're going to talk a little bit more about what this means. The Quebec Charter recognizes that all human beings are equal in worth and dignity. This equality would be hollow if some people were silenced because of their opinions. The purpose of protecting freedom of expression is therefore to ensure that everyone can manifest their thoughts, opinions, beliefs, indeed all expressions of the heart and mind, however unpopular, distasteful, or contrary to the mainstream. That's important because this is really what freedom of expression ends up being about. As Justice McLaughlin, as she then was, wrote in the uh, Queen and Zundel, the view of the majority has no need of constitutional protection. In fact, the exercise of freedom of expression presupposes at the same time that it fosters society's tolerance of expression that is unpopular, offensive, or repugnant. This is a very important concept when we're talking about freedom of expression because you don't need that freedom unless somebody is going to try to shut you up. You know, if you're trying to say something that nobody is offended by, then nobody's going to try to stop you and the right doesn't end up being triggered. So the court goes on to say, freedom to express harmless opinions that reflect a consensus is not freedom. This is why freedom of expression does not truly begin until it gives rise to a duty to tolerate what other people say. So this is kind of interesting because there's sort of noting that freedom of expression requires other people to be tolerant of at least hearing it, or at least the possibility of hearing it or having other people hear it. It thus ensures the development of a democratic, open, and pluralistic society. Understood in this sense, a person's right to free expression is protected not in order to protect him, but in order to protect a public good, a benefit which respect for the right of free expression brings to all those who live in the society in which it is respected, even, though who, even those who have no personal interest in their own freedom. So we all want to live in a society where you have this free expression, where you can hear different uh, different opinions, where people aren't living in fear of expressing themselves. So limits on freedom of expression are justified where, in a given context, there are serious reasons to fear harm that is sufficiently specific and cannot be prevented by the discernment and critical judgment of the audience. So that's kind of key here, is that it has to be something that, you know, overwhelms that. So, for example, the law of defamation rests on the idea that false allegations can so very quickly and completely destroy a good reputation. A reputation tarnished by libel can seldom regain its former luster. So, defamation protects you against people making false claims about you. Similarly, the prohibition against hate speech is justified not only because it causes emotional distress to the members of a vulnerable group, but also because it propagates within social discourse premises of inferiority that may gradually desensitize the majority and lay the groundwork for later broad attacks. So it isn't the emotional distress really that they're talking about here. It's the harm to society and the, uh, the risks down the road. Similar social harm justifies the prohibition against exposing to public view certain types of obscene material that portrays degrading and dehumanizing depictions of sex as being normal, acceptable, or even desirable, insofar as such material predisposes those exposed to it to sexually violent behavior incompatible with the proper functioning of society. And this is the case of the Queen and Butler, which is one I am not a fan of, because they didn't actually require any proof that it actually does predispose anyone to sexually violent behavior. And so this ends up banning a lot of uh, material that I think or I suspect that uh, a lot of material that does not actually cause those. And in fact, this ended up being the basis of a later case, which is Little Sisters uh, Book and Art Emporium in Canada, where that same rule from Butler ended up being used against uh, minority groups, in particular, it, it was used to target uh, homosexual literature, uh, magazines, etc. So I'm not the hugest fan of Butler, but they are relying on it here and I guess re-emphasizing it. So if I had any hopes that the Supreme Court might walk away from Butler, it's not happening here. I'll talk about Butler in some future video. It's, it's one I'll uh, go on a rant about, but that'll be for later.
So in contrast, the prohibition against publishing false news was held to be unconstitutional because it was based on a very vague definition of the social harm to be addressed, a definition that made it far too broad. In our view, limits on freedom of expression are also justified where it is used to disseminate expression that, even if it does not fully meet the definition of hatred set out in Watcott, nonetheless forces certain persons to argue for their basic humanity or social standing as a precondition to participating in the deliberative aspects of our democracy. So what they mean there is basically, uh, you know, if you are undermining the humanity of those people, they may be in a position where they can't fully participate in society anymore. So they're saying that might be an acceptable limit. Uh, Professor Waldron White, uh, writes, a person must be able to walk down the street without fear of insult or humiliation, to find the shops and exchanges open to him, and to proceed with an implicit assurance of being able to interact with others without being treated as a pariah. Now this I find really interesting in terms of things because, I mean, this is often what we talk about as sort of social responses to objectionable speech. We normally say when somebody says something objectionable, you don't have to like them. You don't have to, you know, but here they're talking about this as, you know, a person must be able. To... Now, this is based on protected grounds, but Quebec protects, for instance, political affiliations. I think that this opens some interesting doors that I don't know that the Supreme Court necessarily meant to open. And... I don't know that the tribunal will actually sort of recognize them as potentially being open, but I have some concerns about this. This is one of these things that I don't think uh, the news or other commentators have really latched on to. Um, how far does this go? Well, uh, you know, that's just something to consider, I guess, is, you know, what exactly does this mean? It is understood that these limits also apply in an artistic context. This court has already recognized in Butler that artistic expression rests at the heart of the values underlying freedom of expression. However, the court has declined to make artistic expression a category in its own right with a status superior to that of general freedom of expression. There is no reason to reverse that position. The artistic context of an expressive activity is and always will be relevant as this court's decisions clearly demonstrate. However, there are lots of laws that provide exceptions for artistic expression that they don't provide for other expressions. So I'm not, and those have been upheld. So I'm not really sure how far this actually goes. This seems, this seems strange to me, uh, given how often we have specific exceptions for, uh, for art, artistic expression. So in our view, however, freedom of expression cannot give an artist, to the extent that a person can be described as such, a level of protection higher than that of other persons. The flip side of this is that that means that the ordinary person does not have a level of protection lower than an artist. So this is really important because when we're looking at what happens to Mr. Ward, the same rules basically are going to apply to Mr. Ward as to anyone else. So that is going to be a uh, a major concern here, just in terms of how how much this impacts us. Now, keep in mind, this is Quebec legislation. And, you know, while some of my viewers are in Quebec, lots are not. I'm not in Quebec, but lots of provinces, I think all the provinces, have similar human rights tribunals set up. Uh, I might be wrong about all, but I think so. And so these same principles are going to apply to other tribunals in other provinces. This is, again, potentially a big uh, decision. So the court is going to look at the approach in Watcott, which I'm skipping over a little bit here. But uh, they note, Mr. Watcott had distributed flyers vilifying homosexuals to members of the public. The complainants, who had received the flyers at their homes, argued that the material promoted hatred against individuals because of their sexual orientation, a prohibited ground recognized by the Saskatchewan statute. And proceedings were brought against him before the province's Human Rights Tribunal, and there were a bunch of arguments about, is this restriction constitutional? So they said, this category did not include hurt feelings, humiliation, or offensiveness. The objective of Section 14.1b was to prevent discriminatory effects, 
not to discourage repugnant or offensive ideas or to censor ideas or to compel anyone to think correctly. The intent of the author of the expression was therefore irrelevant, as was the content or nature of the ideas expressed. Even if repugnant and offensive, expression that did not incite abhorrence, delegitimization, or rejection did not risk socially harmful effects such as discrimination. It was therefore not likely to expose anyone to hatred within the meaning of Section 141b of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code. Determining whether expression met that definition required an objective assessment based on the reasonable person standard. So again, they're limiting it. It's not just hurt feelings. It's not just to, you know, censor ideas or to compel anyone to think correctly. People can have wrong thoughts. They can have wrong opinions. They can have offensively wrong opinions. And the law protects your right to do that. So long as it doesn't rise to this level that's going to cause socially harmful effects. So he noted that to satisfy the rational connection requirement, the hate speech to be suppressed must rise to a level beyond merely impugning individuals. It must seek to marginalize the group by affecting its social status and acceptance in the eyes of the majority. However, protecting the emotions of an individual group member is not rationally connected to the overall purpose of reducing discrimination. So that was why, in his view, the prohibition against any representation that ridicules, belittles, or affronts dignity was not justified under Section 1 of the Canadian Charter. Uh, these words refer to expression which is derogatory and insensitive, such as representations criticizing or making fun of protected groups on the basis of their commonly shared characteristics and practices, or on stereotypes. A democratic society concerned about preserving freedom of expression must make space for that kind of discourse, given that it typically does not lead to the systemic discrimination against vulnerable groups that the legislature was seeking to eradicate. So many, or perhaps most people, would find that speech offensive, objectionable. Um, you know, you might throw somebody out of your house if they started talking like that. You might, you know, stop hanging out with a friend who, who makes those kinds of comments. But that doesn't mean that this is a place where the government needs to step in. That's the distinction. Stuff I don't like versus stuff that we need the government to actually stop. And so the, that distinction is really important in order to have a meaningful and full freedom of expression. So this is uh, a professor talking about the nature of the social harm that justified limiting freedom of expression in Watcott. And again, this is a translation. Canadian law protects the victim's social standing while forgoing protection of the victim's emotional serenity. Offensive words are tolerated, whereas expression that is likely to lead to discrimination, ostracism, or violence against individuals is prohibited. The harm that may, in this context, justify departing from freedom of expression, therefore has two characteristics. The apprehended harm is meant to be collective and social in nature. The prohibited harm is therefore social and not mental, collective and not individual. So it doesn't protect your feelings, but it does protect your ability to navigate society. So if people are going to, you know, harm you because of those things, or they're going to start blocking you out of stores or things like that, then that's the level of speech that the court is saying is toler or is, you know, no longer tolerable. So they say, and this is now beginning to apply this in terms of the test that applies where there's a conflict between the right to safeguard of dignity and the right to freedom of expression. So now the court is moving on to say, listen, sometimes rights collide. You know, you might have a right to dignity and other people have a right to freedom of expression. How do we deal with it when one right is going to trample on the other right, where there's this conflict of rights? They say, in this process, it is important to avoid giving Section 4 a scope so broad that it would neutralize freedom of expression or so vague that it would be inconsistent with the principles laid down by this court in Taylor and Watcott. Finally, although this is not determinative in our analysis, we note that an infringement of Section 10 may lead not only to a civil action, but also to penal proceedings under Section 134 sub 1 of the Quebec Charter. If it were necessary to find one, this would be an additional reason to clarify the applicable test. What the court is saying here is, hey, um, you know, we have those previous decisions that set out, you know, a strong protection for freedom of expression. Uh, 
And now the courts have been giving this section four a very fuzzy and vague and broad interpretation that really steps on that. And they say, although we don't need to, it's kind of worth noting that Mr. Ward could have been sent to jail. Like they came after him for $35,000, but in theory, they could have put him in jail. And so when you have jail at risk, you know, of, uh, you know, of telling the wrong joke, you really have to be clear as to what the wrong joke is. And you really have to be certain that it's something that needs to be uh, limited in that fashion. Skipping ahead a little further, the applicable test must not be focused either on the repugnant or offensive nature of the expression or on the emotional harm caused to the person. Otherwise, it would amount to censoring expression because of its content or its impact on a person, regardless of its discriminatory effects. An approach of this kind has been rejected by the court, and again, they're citing Watcott here. The test for resolving a conflict between the right to freedom of expression and the right to the safeguard of dignity requires rather that it be determined, first, whether a reasonable person, aware of the relevant context and circumstances, would view the expression targeting an individual or group as inciting others to vilify them or to detest their humanity on the basis of a prohibited ground of discrimination. This first criterion is more in keeping with the requirements of the Canadian Charter as formulated in Watcott. Hate speech within the meaning of Watcott is therefore prohibited as is expression that has the same effects on personal dignity without meeting the definition of hatred given in that case. Second, it must be shown that a reasonable person would view the expression considered in its context as likely to lead to discriminatory treatment of the person targeted. And the context here, remember, is a comedy show. So discrimination within the meaning of the Quebec Charter therefore involves differential treatment that affects an individual's social acceptance. As a result, only expression that, considered in its context, is likely to jeopardize the social acceptance of the individual or group is discriminatory. And again, that's citing to Watcott. The analysis is focused not on the content of the expression as such, but its likely effects on third parties, that is, the discriminatory treatment likely to result from it. Now, we've heard that the tribunal found that he was bullied as a, res as a result of this, which kind of sounds a bit weird in this context where they're saying, hey, you know, jeopardize the social acceptance. If he's being bullied as a result of that, is that not potentially something somebody's going to argue is jeopardizing the social acceptance? I, I find this reasoning a little hard to sort of mesh with the facts as the court is accepting and the results. So I'm just going to flag this as weird and as maybe not making the most sense. In this regard, the mode of expression and the effect of the mode of expression are determinative. Expression that stirs up extreme and intrinsically dangerous emotions like hatred in an audience clearly does not have the same impact as expression that is calm and rational. This does not mean, of course, that speech that purports to be scientific or rational is incapable of arousing the contempt of the majority of the humanity of vulnerable groups. But in general, expression that appeals to an audience's reason or to emotions free of any real motivating force will be unlikely to lead to discriminatory treatment of the targeted individual or group. Again, I think this is weird because um, when we look at the history of racism and discrimination and so forth, a lot of this has been justified by purportedly scientific materials. And they're not good scientific materials, but they, they present things in this fashion. And so there's a lot of stuff out there that purports to be scientific or rational, as they say. I, I don't know that this is really something I would have hung my hat on as a, as a determining factor here. But that's, uh, that's the court's reasoning here. Before we proceed with our analysis, a few observations must be made about expression that occurs in private. The application of, of the Quebec Charter, unlike the legislation at issue in Watcott, is not limited to expression that is broadcast or published. It is not impossible that expression that occurs in private will be discriminatory under the Quebec Charter in exceptional cases. So in theory, you could face these kinds of tribunals 
for something you say in private to just, you know, somebody else you know, if somehow it was overheard or recorded. So that's interesting. You can say, first, the expression must, in the eyes of the reasonable person, be likely to incite vilification or detestation of the humanity of the person targeted. Second, a reasonable person must conclude that the expression, considered in its context, would likely have led third parties, if they had been present, to discriminate against the individual targeted. At the risk of repeating ourselves, the analysis must be focused on the likely discriminatory effects of the expression, not on the emotional harm suffered by the person alleging discrimination. These principles, having been outlined, their application to expression that is humorous in nature calls for two remarks. First, expression that attacks or ridicules people may inspire feelings of disdain or superiority in relation to them, but it generally does not encourage the denial of their humanity or their marginalization in the eyes of the majority. Watcott at paragraphs 89 to 91. It is true that ridicule, if pushed to the limit, could cross this line, but it will do so only in extreme and unusual circumstances. Now, again, this kind of seems a little strange, because if you did an entire comedy show that was making fun of, you know, whatever particular racial group, lots of people might say that that was encouraging the denial of their humanity or their marginalization, depending on how it was going. Because, of course, there's different ways to do that. You know, you may see people who are from a particular racial group sort of poking fun at the peccadilloes of their own culture. Uh, or you may see people who are doing so specifically because they want people to think less of that particular culture. Ultimately, this is going to be something that lower courts are going to have to sort of feel their way through. Second, humor, whether in good or bad taste, rarely has, and again, this is a translation, the spillover effect needed to give rise to an attitude of hatred and discrimination among third parties. It involves well-known methods such as exaggeration, overgeneralization, provocation, and distortion of reality. The audience is able to identify these methods when they are clear and must be acknowledged to be discerning enough not to take everything said at face value. So the court here is basically saying, listen, people can tell the difference between cartoons and real life. People can tell the difference between a comedy show and something that is presented uh, seriously. This is all the more true where the expression comes from a person publicly known for their particular type of humor, or where it targets a public figure whose fame exposes them to such commentary. Other than in exceptional cases, it would be surprising if expression in such circumstances had enough motivating force to lead to discriminatory treatment. And keep in mind as well, this is a public figure uh, who is in part a public figure because of the disability. So in terms of, you know, a comedian and their approach to that, it's almost certainly going to end up referencing this in some fashion. These clarifications must not be interpreted as resulting in a form of impunity for comedians or as diminishing the protection given by law to public figures. There is less of a risk that expression will lead to discrimination where it involves supposedly humorous comments that are made by a well-known comedian or that concern a person known to the public. And in the absence of a sufficiently serious risk, the claim must fail. I'm not sure why they say well-known comedian. Like, if you go to an open mic night and you tell some really bad jokes that just bomb, are you more likely to be dragged in front of the tribunal than somebody, you know, well-known who makes those comments? I don't... There's a lot of places where this decision is referencing sort of distinguishing elements that I go, really? That's the distinguishing element? We're going to go with well-known? Anyway, moving on. Application to this case. So now they're going to take those principles that they've established and apply them in this specific case to uh, see what the result will be. In summary, we are of the view that Mr. Gabriel was made subject to a distinction by being targeted by Mr. Ward's comments. However, in light of the tribunal's findings that Mr. Ward, and again translation, did not choose Jeremy because of his handicap, and I'm mispronouncing his name, apologies, but it's been a while since I really spoke French, but rather because he was a public personality, it must be concluded that the distinction was not based on a prohibited ground. This conclusion on its own is sufficient to dispose of the appeal.
Nonetheless, we believe that it will be helpful to analyze discrimination in its entirety in light of the particular context of this case. So what they're saying here is the tribunal says he's not selected because of his handicap, but because he's a public figure. That's why he was being mocked here, because Mr. Ward identified a bunch of public figures that he identified as sort of unmockable and then decided he was going to go ahead and mock them anyway, just kind of to raise some shock and ire. You know, he's going after Celine Dion, who has long been a uh, a treasured figure in Quebec. Uh, so that's why this person was selected. And because it was selected on the basis of him being this public, unmockable figure, that it's not based, you know, on him being disabled. It's based on him being, you know, a, the guy who sings in front of the Pope. So that's uh they say that's enough to dispose of it we're just going to look at the rest of it so that we know how to apply the law in future that's why they're going through the rest of the analysis here so a distinction exclusion or preference as the court stated in bombardier the first element of discrimination is not problematic the plaintiff must prove differential treatment that is that a decision a measure or conduct affects him or her differently from others to whom it may apply now, that doesn't, you'll note the affects him or her differently from others to whom it may apply. It doesn't mean that they have to necessarily uh, be discriminatory in the sense of having two separate rules. Sometimes a single rule can affect two different people differently. Uh, so as an example here, let's say we have a, a big company and they're in a, you know, a building that has eight floors and they say, listen, um, for fitness reasons, we are going to ban all employees from taking the elevator. Okay, so they want people to get their stairs in, which sounds great, except if you're thinking that, you know, somebody's in a wheelchair and they say, hey, um, I, I got wheels. I can't take the stairs. If the company says, tough, the rule is stairs or don't bother coming to work. It might be a rule that applies equally to everybody. Nobody can take the elevator, but the guy in the wheelchair is differentially treated by it. Or somebody who's walking with a cane or, you know, otherwise has trouble with the stairs. They're going to be affected, you know, differently. It's discriminatory against them. So that's what they're talking about here in that particular phrasing. Uh, then again, the rule could be explicit. It could be, you know, nobody here who's in a wheelchair is allowed to work here. That would be an example of an explicitly discriminatory rule. So Mr. Ward is a professional comedian who says that he uses dark humor. In the routine in his show called The Untouchables and in his comedy videos, he held several public figures up to ridicule. Or ridicule. Mr. Gabriel was one of them. The tribunal found that Mr. Gabriel has, had been subjected to differential treatment by being exposed to mockery in Mr. Ward's comedy shows and videos. In our view, no intervention is warranted with respect to this finding of fact in the absence of a palpable and overriding error. So this is standard of review stuff. They say this is the findings of the tribunal. Um, we're only going to flip that if it's a palpable and overriding error. So a clear error that just cannot stand. So the court says it doesn't matter if we agree with it or not. We're just we're not going to flip this. That being said, a distinction alone cannot suffice. The distinction in question must have been based on a prohibited ground, which is the second element of discrimination. So based on a prohibited ground, the tribunal referring to Bombardier correctly identified the applicable test for the second element of discrimination. Under that test, the plaintiff has the burden of showing that there is a connection between a prohibited ground of discrimination and the distinction, exclusion, or preference of which he or she complains, or in other words, that the ground in question was a factor in the distinction, exclusion, or preference. In other words, for a particular decision or action to be considered discriminatory, the prohibited ground need only have contributed to it. The tribunal's conclusion on this point is contradictory. First, it found, in light of the evidence as a whole, that Mr. Ward did not choose Mr. Gabriel as a target because of his handicap, but rather because he was a public personality who attracted public sympathy and seemed to be untouchable. The distinction identified at first by the tribunal was therefore not based on a prohibited ground. Its analysis should have ended there. So that's kind of, this is this kind of language I 
always love looking at in decisions where you've got the court kind of just laying a little bit of snark on it. And they clearly put some snark on, on in that line. In our view, the tribunal erred when it continued its analysis by focusing on Mr. Ward's actual comments to determine whether they were related to Mr. Gabriel's disability, despite its finding that Mr. Ward's decision to make jokes about Mr. Gabriel was not in itself discriminatory. Yeah, you can't have two findings that contradict each other. So they basically say that their reasoning essentially involved finding that there was a distinction based on a prohibited ground because the comments referred to such a ground. But the mere mention of a prohibited ground cannot in itself establish that the ground was a factor in the differential treatment. It may, of course, be an indication that this was the case, but it is certainly not sufficient evidence. So... Again, here the tribunal made an explicit finding to the contrary. And of course, it would be hard not to, given that he mocked several figures that were not Mr. Gabriel. And so it's going to be hard to say that he picked Mr. Gabriel out for his disability when he's also mocking Celine Dion, who, to my knowledge, is not disabled in any fashion. Now, if he'd picked out like five or six people, all of whom had disabilities, then they'd be in a stronger place here. So in light of its finding that Mr. Gabriel had been targeted by Mr. Ward's comments because of his fame and not because of his disability, the tribunal had no choice but to conclude that the second element of discrimination had not been established. In disregarding its own finding of fact, the tribunal overlooked the specific nature of the claim before it. It confined itself to the message and the harm, and it conducted its analysis as it would in an action for defamation, where the plaintiff is not required to prove either differential treatment or a connection to a prohibited ground of discrimination. So again, this is a, an issue with the tribunal stepping outside of its role. Moreover, and with respect, the majority of the Court of Appeal ignored the tribunal's first finding of fact and erroneously substituted their own analysis by concluding that Mr. Ward chose Mr. Gabriel both because of his fame and because of his disability. So the, the Court of Appeal actually looks at this and says, Oh, crud, the tribunal made a mistake. And so the way they're fixing that mistake is to basically swap out the facts from the tribunal's decision. And the Supreme Court says, nah, you can't do that. Unless there's a really strong reason to change the tribunal's original facts, you're stuck with them. You can't do that. So that's the error that the Supreme Court is pointing out here. They say, that being said, even if we were to adopt the tribunal's position or that of the majority of the Court of Appeal, the outcome of this appeal would not be affected in view of the conclusion that we reach on the third element of discrimination. So even if the tribunal was right here or the Court of Appeal were right here, they're still wrong. Oh, impairing the recognition of the right of the safeguard of dignity. The last element of discrimination requires establishing whether the differential treatment based on a prohibited ground impairs Mr. Gabriel's right to full and equal recognition of his right to the safeguard of his dignity. This step must begin with a determination of whether the protection of Mr. Gabriel's right to the safeguard of his dignity is called for in light of section 9.1 of the Charter. For this purpose, this right must be balanced against Mr. Ward's right to freedom of expression. So again, you see this model where Mr. Ward's right to freedom of expression actually carves out from Mr. Gabriel's right. It's not a defense. It actually, you know, Mr. Gabriel's right doesn't apply where Mr. Ward's right to freedom of expression does, if that makes sense. The conflict between the fundamental rights invoked by the parties can be resolved by applying the test out above. It must first be asked whether a reasonable person, aware of the relevant context and circumstances, would view the expression targeting Mr. Gabriel as inciting others to vilify him or to detest his humanity on the basis of a prohibited ground of discrimination. It must then be asked whether this reasonable person would view the expression, considered in its context, as likely to lead to discriminatory treatment of Mr. Gabriel. In our opinion, the comments made by Mr. Ward meet neither of these two requirements. In her dissent, uh, Savard properly emphasized the importance of considering expression in its context. The context here is that of a dark comedy show meant for an audience that had paid to hear this kind of talk. In his show, Mr. Ward said that it had become impossible in Quebec to mock people without risking legal proceedings. Again, the irony here is huge. <laughs> 
He said that he wanted to take the take risks and poke fun at the untouchables, that is, people whom Quebecers like and who are successful and powerful. How's that working out for you? I mean, it's kind of working out for Canadians generally because now we have this decision that protects, uh, you know, freedom of expression. But I kind of feel like this will have come at a tremendous cost to Mr. Ward. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. That is, or sorry, after mocking the physical appearance of many public figures, Mr. Ward came to Mr. Gabriel, whom he described to his audience as a young person with a loudspeaker on his head. Alluding to the complaints of those who do not really appreciate Mr. Gabriel's artistic talent, he said that he had defended Mr. Gabriel's right to live out his dream, believing that he was about to die. So this is the comedy bit here. Mr. Ward added that, because Mr. Gabriel had not died, he had tried to drown him but had not succeeded. In ending the routine, he said that he had discovered from searches that Mr. Gabriel's illness was being ugly. As for the video, it was made in connection with the release of Mr. Gabriel's autobiography in 2008, two years after the launch of the show in issue. The comedian made the video available on his professional website for about a year. It consisted of a photograph of the young Mr. Gabriel in which only the eyes and mouth moved. Using a disguised voice, Mr. Ward made his target speak in the first person. In the video, Mr. Gabriel was presented as a young person with a loudspeaker on his head and a mouth that did not close all the way. Mr. Gabriel's testimony spoke volumes about the pain caused to him by these, those hurtful words, which date back to a time when he was still a young teenager. There's certainly nothing uplifting in the fact that a popular, well-known comedian used his platform to make fun of a young man with a disability. Be that as it may, the question here is not whether Mr. Ward's comments were in good or bad taste. Rather, a legal framework must be applied to comments that were made in a specific context. That legal framework is focused on the likely discriminatory effect of the comments, not on the emotional harm suffered by the person targeted. And not, as the court is noting here, the, of whether or not they're in good taste. The court should not be the arbiter of whether or not something is in good or bad taste uh, with substantial financial sanctions. So that's the, uh, that's the concern here. In our view, a reasonable person aware of the relevant circumstances would not view Mr. Ward's comments about Mr. Gabriel as inciting others to vilify him or to detest his humanity on the basis of a prohibited ground of discrimination. His comments, considered in their context, cannot be taken at face value. Although Mr. Ward said some nasty and disgraceful things about Mr. Gabriel's disability, his comments did not incite the audience to treat Mr. Gabriel as subhuman. In both his video and his show, Mr. Ward mocked some of Mr. Gabriel's physical characteristics. Making fun of a person's physical characteristics may be repugnant. It most certainly is when the person in question is a young person with a disability who contributes with determination to society. But expression of this kind does not, simply by being repugnant, incite others to detest or vilify the humanity of the person targeted. The first requirement of the test is therefore not met, and the analysis could end here. It doesn't end here. I'm sorry. I know this is a long video, but we're going to get through the majority decision. And then in another video, I'll cover the minority, the view that didn't carry the day. And you can look at how vastly different they are. That being said, even if we had found that the comments incited others to vilify Mr. Gabriel or to detest his humanity on the basis of a prohibited ground, the analysis of the second requirement of the test set out in this decision would have led to the denial of the claim. So even if we found this, he still doesn't win. He win he loses on every single point. A reasonable person could not view the comments made by Mr. Ward, considered in their context, as likely to lead to discriminatory treatment of Mr. Gabriel. At first instance, the tribunal found that Mr. Gabriel's classmates were inspired by Mr. Ward's comments to make fun of him. That evidence is relevant only insofar as it tells us something about the likely effect of the comments. It must be remembered that the test is objective. It should therefore be kept in mind that something that occurs following a person's conduct is not necessarily a result of that conduct. Thus, the fact that people are inspired by certain comments does not mean that this is a likely effect of those comments. Of course, it is foreseeable that comments made by a well-known comedian will have repercussions outside of their initial context, but that does not mean that those repercussions can necessarily be attributed to the comedian. It must still be determined whether, viewed objectively, the comments encourage such repercussions. In our view, that is not the case here. So this is a causation kind of issue. How do we know that Mr. Gabriel's mocking in high school 
uh, was because Mr. Ward did the comedy routine. And they say, well, you can see that some of the comments, some of the insults that people were making were borrowing from the comedy bit. But when you think about it, and this is real, you know, I did not have a great experience in high school. Um, there, I had a high school reunion coming up a while in the, in the past, and I thought about it and I went, I don't want to see any of those people. Why would I go to that? So I didn't. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of high school. And it's especially part of high school if you are somebody who, unfortunately, you know, looks different in some fashion. And it's probably especially so if not only do you look different, but also that, you know, you're a public figure, you know, you're famous. So the problem that they have here is the question of would people have bothered him in any event? You know, is this something that did Mr. Ward cause something that wouldn't otherwise have happened? And I think that's kind of a tough thing to establish. And, you know, I feel kind of horrible saying that because, you know, it's a young kid. But there is an issue in terms of this, uh, this proof issue. So they say the impugned comments involved open provocation and systematic uh, exaggeration, methods that increased their deris or derisory effect. Or derisory effect. They're made by a career comedian known for this type of humor. They exploited, rightly or wrongly, a feeling of discomfort in order to entertain, but they did little more than that. As a result, the comments made in the video and the show, con considered in their context, were not likely to have a spillover effect that could lead to a discriminatory treatment of Mr. Gabriel. Accordingly, the Commission did not meet the requirements for succeeding under Section 4 and 10 of the Quebec Charter. But this conclusion does not mean that Mr. Gabriel was without recourse following these events. So this is going to say, hey, listen, you went to the wrong place. You know, this is a, sir, this is a Wendy's kind of argument. You could have gotten the result you wanted, but you had to go to a different court. So other recourses were available. For example, though we express no opinion on the chances of success of these alternative recourses, Mr. Gabriel could have invoked the protection against harassment provided for in Section 10.1 of the Charter because of the fact that he'd been bullied. He could also have brought an action in defamation. However, neither the Commission nor the Tribunal has jurisdiction over defamation. The combination of the norm of equality in the Quebec Charter and the right to the safeguard of dignity cannot confer such jurisdiction on them indirectly. So this seems to be the big issue here for the Supreme Court is these tribunals taking on this power to pursue essentially defamation claims when really they should be confining themselves more narrowly to discrimination cases. And they say, viewed as a discrimination case, this one ultimately fails. So disposition. The appeal is allowed without costs. The judgments of the Tribunal and the Court of Appeal are set aside as they relate to Mr. Gabriel. So, uh, and the reason why they say as they relate to Mr. Gabriel, there were some issues with regards to Mr. Gabriel's mother, and the court, uh, the Tribunal had found an award for the mother. The Court of Appeal had rejected that award and had bounced it, and so that's not, uh, that's not at issue here. Now, this appeal is allowed without costs. I've mentioned before the, uh, the impact in terms of the differential funding here because Mr. Gabriel would have been covered by the commission. He would have not paid any, you know, any costs here, whereas Mr. Ward is funded by his own wallet. And so this comes out of his pocket. Um, at the end of the day, the Supreme Court is not making a costs award. And so Mr. Ward is going to have been left with really huge legal bills and Mr. Gabriel is going to walk away with nothing owing. And you might say, yeah, that's, you know, in this case, I, you know, it's given who Mr. Gabriel is, it's kind of hard to say, hey, you know, he really needs to be kicked again, right? I, I kind of feel like, you know, and Mr. Ward probably can eat the costs. But that's not always the circumstances. Sometimes these are cases that are brought against uh, people who are not people of means. Uh, sometimes they're brought against people who themselves might be victims of discrimination in various fashions. So 
this, you know, the it is worth considering the impacts or sort of the disproportionate weight and how it can encourage complaints that might not otherwise have been brought. I don't know if Mr. Gabriel would have brought this complaint had it had to proceed as a defamation claim. If the commission had said, listen, this is not a discrimination claim. This is a defamation claim. You have to go to court on your own dollar. Then we don't know if it would have happened or not. Um, some, you know, people are going to talk about, you know, punching up versus punching down in this uh, context. And I, I think those are fine as a notion for sort of our social reactions to things, but not necessarily a great way to deal with things in terms of freedom of expression. You know, what the court applies, because sometimes, as in this case, it can actually be kind of difficult to tell who's punching in which direction. I mean, Mr. Ward is from, you know, it seems like he's selling out shows. He's probably got a little bit of dollars. Um, somehow he funded this legislate or this uh, this case. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, that money's got to be coming from somewhere. I'm assuming he's got some money. Uh, Mr. Gabriel, maybe not so much. But in terms of the social position, the whole point of why he was doing this comedy bit was to say, listen, these are people who are, you know, protected. This is a punching up kind of scenario. It, I mean, it can really be hard to sort all these things out. It would be a very difficult rule for the courts to follow. So this is a, a difficult case. I think that ultimately, um, what will probably be of importance to a lot of Canadians is the restraint on human rights tribunals, because there have been concerns raised about people using human rights tribunals as, you know, means for profit or as means of striking back at somebody who's offended you, these kinds of concerns. And this decision may limit the scope of human rights tribunals a little further. This, of course, is going to also be relevant with respect to the online harms legislation that, uh, that Trudeau and his government are looking to push forward because they're very much trying to follow this kind of, uh, this kind of model, the human rights tribunal kind of model. And so this decision will necessarily end up constraining that a bit. But of course, it's a 5-4 decision. It's real narrow, and we'll see if it holds up um, later with perhaps a differently composed court. So all of this is going to be a real interesting uh, set of circumstances to look at going forward. I can't say how all of this is going to work out in, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, it's, but I am, you know, I am happy with this decision. I don't know that... Uh, you know, I don't know that Mr. Ward is a hero in the sense that, you know, he, what he said was probably stuff that a lot of people wouldn't like hearing. But in terms of the overall effect, I'm glad that we have this case now to preserve, uh, you know, preserve freedom of expression. Freedom of expression cases almost invariably come out from somebody who said things that are objectionable in some fashion. In fact, most of our freedom of expression cases come from people who said far worse things than this. You know, this is uh, far less bad than what we see from a lot of the other cases. And uh, that's just something to be aware of as we, uh, you know, when we look at cases like this. Anyway, this video is long enough. It's uh, a little over an hour, so I'm going to sort of wrap it up here. Thank you for watching. I hope that you found this to be interesting. I mean, this is a case that has been discussed quite a bit in the news. And so I wanted to share it with you and go in on a bit of a deep dive with it to really try to understand why the Supreme Court decided what they did and how they decided what they did. Because I think a lot of the media reports are not necessarily giving you the full picture here. Full picture, of course, sometimes takes a little while. Anyway, Thank you for watching. I, again, want to thank you for making it this far. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters uh, at the $50 level, Jonathan Wheeler, Canada's National Farms Association, Mike, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint, 
CCFR and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited and Mark Olivier Demour. And at the $20 level, Raymond Dell McKinnon, Matt Ward, Mark Whittington, Jane Baven Luxor, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, and Aaron Del Salt. Thank you uh, to, as well to the $10 supporters who are on the crawl immediately following. I'm finishing this up. It's late at night, so I'm a little punchy at this stage. Uh, again, please like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to see more content if you found this to be useful. Thank you once again, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.